yeah, thank you for coming, and here's our, here's our talk. Thank you, thank you. It's good to see you guys today. Uh, if you're a veteran, uh, thank you for your service to our country and the hard work and devotion uh, that that uh, involves. I've been uh, involved in training military chaplains pretty extensively, and they've given me more of a window on that than maybe I would have had otherwise, and so my appreciation for that is, uh, is great, and uh, we want to honor you uh, this weekend. Uh, there are moments in your life that come along that define all the other moments in your life. There are certain junctures that are controlling for what happens from that moment forward. But some of them are really global, like the first message ever sent on the internet, which was between two computers in California <coughs> hardwired to one another, if you can imagine that. And some of them are personal, like the wedding or the birth of a child. That moment changes all your other moments. Nothing will ever be the same. And some of them sound more like, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Now Malcolm Gladwell famously has called moments like this tipping points in a parallel sort of a way. And uh, that concept has so much traction in our culture that it has become a game show it's a country western song, and it is the title of every other video on YouTube. Donald Trump, The Tipping Point. Global Warming, The Tipping Point. <laughs> it's the most popular title, I think, in the history of, uh, of the whole world. And uh, often you think of it as something catastrophic, like the ice sheets are melting and the world is doomed, but it, it can really kind of work both ways. Uh, you know, if you get a lot of junk mail at your house, like we do, if you get junk mail that comes to your address, but it has the names of eight or ten people on it and it happens regularly, it means one of two things. One, your space has been used to rent to Cal students over the years. Or two, you are living in a former crack house. Now, two is Jan and me. We moved into a house that used to be a drug house, and so we still get all of this mail from people we probably don't really... Uh, what to know, and when we first moved to Berkeley, <laughs> it was much more apparent what the house used to be, because you know, even houses have baggage, like people do, and so generous friends showed up and said, this will not do, we need to help you get this place looking like people will not be afraid to come over, because they were awkward and nervous, they would look around like that all of the time, and so uh, a team showed up and helped us paint some stuff, and other people showed up and did windows and all kinds of stuff, and and at least put the house at a kind of a minimum standard. And when the first wave of that work happened, I will never forget this. When the first wave of it was done and it was apparent to the neighborhood that improvements had been made, the next day in the morning, when I went out on the deck, I heard my neighbor scraping paint. <laughs> That's a sound we had never heard. I've heard many sounds in my neighborhood, but I have not heard that sound. And that one scraping of paint, with no government involvement at all that I'm aware of, became a tidal wave of home improvement, renovation, houses gutted. Now we're down to no uh, empty houses on the street at all, ex except for one that's caught up in a legal dispute. And we've gone down from multiple problem situations to just one crime and drug house. I mean, it's like heaven on earth up here on Seward Street, all beginning with this one group of people who helped us and did something, and it just changed the atmosphere. The outcome has just been great. Now we have people moving in that, like, families and kids are there. It's, it's a completely different kind of atmosphere. And I saw the other way that Tipping Point can break about two hours ago at the newly renovated McDonald's on University Avenue in, in downtown. I walked in to get my uh, Egg McMuffin, only 300 calories. <laughs> and the great glory of being older, which is the senior's coffee, at McDonald's, 79 cents plus free refills, and I could score a small coffee. It's like amazing, it's unbelievable, and I think their coffee's pretty good. So I order this, and I turn around, and I see one of the countertops that's looking out over the street, which is where I like to sit, because I like to uh, work on things so I kind of with people, you know? And uh, there's a guy in his 20s there, and I notice him immediately because he is slumped over. And I look at his tray, and I can see he has ordered a breakfast burrito, hash browns, and a vanilla milkshake, which is an unusual combination. But what's really unusual is he is unconscious with his face in his breakfast burrito. I, I don't mean he's asleep. Now, 
seeing people asleep in public situations is not something that disturbs you if, if you live here. We see this every day. And the manager comes over, <clears throat> shakes him, taps him, and he just, he just won't wake up. I mean, he's not asleep. He's unconscious, I realize now. And a couple of guys sitting just a couple of booths down start to mock him. And what they're saying out loud so everyone can hear is that he's a drug dealer. And that I, I've seen him selling. Mm -hmm. And you better wake up, bro, because this is bad for business. People will start wondering about the quality of what you're dealing, is what he's saying. Another store employee comes up and tries to shake him. He's, he's still unconscious. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this guy. I can't talk to him because he's incommunicado. I mean, he just he can't speak. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I wonder, say, in junior high school, if this is where you thought your life would go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my goal, my ambition in life is to be in a McDonald's with my face in a burrito. That was, that was my dream. And I, I started wondering about this young man. What puts him on the track to end up three feet from me in a McDonald's with my, my face smashed into my breakfast? Probably somewhere there was a decision. Yeah. Probably a small one. But that decision put his life on a trajectory that with enough time and enough momentum started dynamics in motion and like the little snowball at the top of the mountain rolls down and gets bigger and gets bigger. And at first it's small enough for you to stop it and then later it's not quite so small. And then eventually, as Gladwell says, a small reversible thing becomes a large irreversible thing and my, my face is in my food. These points control all the other points. Now, you know, a lot of what we're told if you're a person of faith, you kind of hear the idea a lot that uh, if you're really doing the faith right, it's going to be like an express elevator to God's penthouse. You're gonna get in, punch the up button, and all you're gonna hear is, have you ever been in a high-end office building, you just hear And you have this long, smooth ride up into the glory of God, and all you can say is thank you and praise the Lord for this wonderful, <laughs> trouble-free elevator that even smells good, and there's nobody with a burrito face in here. And then the real world arrives, and the same people that sold me the elevator model tell me that if my actual walk with God isn't working quite so well. It, it's a reflection not on God because he's perfect. It's a reflection on me and if I was just holy enough and righteous enough and read the Bible enough and good enough and worked hard enough and did more good deeds and stuff, then things would be working out because if they're not working out, I must not be doing all those things because everybody knows you just move up through the levels. Well, I've watched the lifestyles of five different adult generations and I can tell you this that uh, the journey's a lot more like walking down a sidewalk in Berkeley where the cement's all heaved up and the tree roots are undermining everything and the cracks are opening all the time and it's so easy to get thrown right on your face if you're not paying attention, if you're looking at Facebook on your phone where you should be looking at all that uneven pavement and you get thrown on your face. So these defining moments, these rough places, these hard choices, they're not distractions, they're the trip. They're the red pins in my map. They're the places where the rest of my journey is, is going to be defined. And, uh, they're, they're so crucial that if I get them right, my life is one thing. If I get them wrong, my life is something else. What of mine was my first desktop computer told you the story before, don't care. I have so much nostalgia for this machine, I may tell it again next week, so just deal with it. It was an Apple IIe clone. Do you even know what one of those looks like? Think of a cardboard box with a little TV on top of it and a typewriter sitting in front and, and you're there. Uh, the speed of the CPU was one. <laughs> Not one anything, just one. 1.04, something, just one. Are, are you with me here? Hard drive? Five thundering megabytes entombed in a 25 pound steel suitcase that sat off to the side and wouldn't operate above a temperature of 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Two 128K floppy drives, five and a quarter inch, the same system, by the way, that runs America's missile arsenal in our silos in the Midwest. 
That's what you used to boot up. That's where all the programs came from. And you fed your printouts over into what was a brother typewriter from which the keyboard had been removed and a daisy wheel had been installed. And the kingdom of God had come. This was my ultimate turning point. From there, it's been a long slide down into iPhones and social media and all the rest of it. And I just, I, can, I, I, I said this to my wife the other day, I can't remember the world before. What did we do? How, how did we spend our time? What did we ever buy? How did we ever, how did we ever get along without the ability to know what my cousin in Nebraska had for breakfast? I, I just don't, <laughs> that whole world, it's just turned the whole corner and has worked for good for me. Lately I've been having this trouble with my car. And the trouble is getting really close to hitting people. <laughs> so it's not really a problem with the car. It's more of an operator error <laughs> issue. And uh, my wife, who is the best person I ever met, and who saved my life many times while I'm driving, I'm actually a pretty competent driver. This is only something that's happened in my life lately. And what happens is I'm pulling out from a Berkeley intersection, which you have to look six different ways five times just to make sure because there's skateboard kids with earbuds and there's people on bikes and there's those spandex people on bikes that don't even slow down at the stop signs or look, they're on a suicide mission, they just don't know it. And all this other stuff going on, so I'm stopping, I'm very careful. And I, and I pull out and Jenny goes, wait, wait, don't you see that bicyclist? I am a bicyclist. I mean, I get it. I'm sensitive to it. And I said, what? What? Well, it's behind the pillar of that I can't quite, quite see it. Not, car's gray. And they're dressed in gray. And I can't blah, blah, blah. Well, about the third time this happened, she reaches over and grabs my arm and says, wait a minute. There's this bicyclist coming right to She looks at me and says, you have forgotten how to drive. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, being a husband, it's my job to resist this kind of idea with everything within me. I said, I forgot how to drive. And she says, you're thinking like a cyclist. <sighs> I am. I am. I'm looking back and forth the way I would if I were riding my bike. We've gone down from two cars to one. I hardly ever touch my car all week <laughs> long. And that has been a turning point. I no longer think like I'm driving a car. Like I'm driving my 15 year old Trek. And every pedestrian in Berkeley is at risk. Mm -hmm. See, these points can take you either way. The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the uh, believers in Jesus in the Roman province of Galatia in the first century. It's basically the territory we would call central Turkey today. It was a network of churches he had been involved in, in founding. And his concern in writing this letter, of course, is to encourage them and to write almost as a father to his children, is, is the tone of it, the things that are positive, the things that are disciplinary. They both have that kind of, your dad talking to you, kind of thing. You know how dads talk? There's sort of some of that kind of feeling uh, in this letter. And he writes to them specifically because they are at something like, the parallel's not 100%, but something like a tipping point. They're teetering. They're teetering. And the reason is, he planted the seeds of the good news about Jesus a long time ago. It's not fresh anymore. It's, it's fairly recent, but there's been enough time for some erosion to take place. And they, and they received what he told them about Jesus, having uh, come from the Father and having taken on the form of the man. Uh, having uh, taught and preached and worked miracles, and having uh, died in, in the place of these people on the cross and making forgiveness from sin and eternal life available just by simple faith, responding to the love and grace of God. And uh, that still sounds like good news, doesn't it? All these years later, they, they had embraced that. But now a few years later, some concerns had arisen from the outside. And, and there were two so here's the, the good news is on one side, and then there's competition that now has arisen on the other side. One is, is uh, no, a group we refer to today as antinomians. And this is a school of thought that says that, well, because you've been forgiven by grace, and grace is full and complete, there's no longer any need for moral restraint of any kind. In other words, you've declared free agency in Christ and aren't accountable 
in any way to uh, others or even to yourself. You just live in the freedom of what your essentially your impulses uh, tell you to do. And so from this point of view, from the point of view of the antinomians, this, this good news is really bad news because it limits your freedom. And so this school of thought is coming to the Christians and saying, you know, you could live a lot more openly and freely than this. Uh, you are allowing your crazy religion to uh, muddle your concept of what's right and wrong to the point where it's restricting your ability to act the way you, you, you feel that should act. And the way to really have freedom is to just step away from that concept, embrace all that grace and forgiveness, but leave all everything else aside. And, and this is going to give you true joy and, and true peace. Now that's a major problema because that wasn't the good news that he brought. The other competition uh, comes from the culture uh, of the area, and this would be syncretism. That is the way culture creeps into faith communities and subtly changes them. Uh, have you ever been to a Berkeley City Council meeting? You must go. Paul has been. Janet and I have both been for many hours. <laughs> they often go into the wee hours of the morning. And uh, what they are famous for is conflict and contentiousness. There is hissing. There is, oh, it's, it's fantastic. It's democracy in action. There, there is, don't watch it online. You have to go. See the spitting and the hissing, the screaming and yelling and name calling. You can tell some people are so angry at the people who are doing this. Other people are reliving the protests of the 60s. And there are all these different uh, cultural groups and economic groups in Australia. And this is what our city is. It is this, this confluence of, 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 it's turbulent here. It just is because you've got so many different forces coming together. And if you can't hack that, you can't really be here because that's just really how it is. And I admire every single one of you for being here, living here, and being here this morning. Because it's a fantastic place. This contentiousness was exactly the culture of Galatia. They were famous for, and for other parts of the empire, they were famous for argument and criticism and harshness and, and conflict. And what happened was this was creeping into their faith community. And they were becoming increasingly nasty with each other. I'll tell you this after watching five adult generations. There's no kind of nasty like Christian nasty. That's true. Mm -hmm. I, I have... <laughs> I'm telling you what, I, 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 a friend who's passed away now was a, a, a world-class yeah. conflict resolution consultant. He'd been hired by the federal government. He had worked uh, at the Wounded Knee Crisis uh, <clears throat> way back so many years ago. He was uh, just one of the top people in America on this, and had, a, had the wonderful chance to take a class with this man on conflict resolution. And he said very simply, nobody fights like evangelicals. They just, they're the worst, <laughs> the absolute worst. This is because they sanctify their opinions and make them the voice of God, and then they enter these jousts with each other that can result in tearing the whole community to pieces, and that's just what they were teetering on the edge. These tipping points can break one way and bless you with a computer. They can break the other way, and you get your face in a burrito at McDonald's. And so... Paul responding, he writes a lot of things to them, but here's one part of Galatians from chapter 5 that I think really is the beating heart of what he's trying to say. And he writes this, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Now, in the original language, those words for bite and devour are the same words that would be used for animals attacking each other. Now, my terrier weighs 11, but he despises pit bulls and other large dogs. And I have on many occasions seen him lunge at one to take him on, probably weighing 75 or 80 pounds. For that pit bull, Ricky is not even an hors d'oeuvre. He just one bite, he's gone. But people who love conflict, sometimes they're like this. Sometimes little people feel like they need to attack, or people who feel small need to attack, because if I can't be big, at least I can sound big. And that is my dog, and that is many people I've seen in conflict. And Paul's saying, listen, it's so heady to feel right. It just fills you with yourself to feel like I've got the, I've got the true word on this, brother, and 
you need to listen to me and you need to do that. And I've, I've, seen, I've seen that happen in, in faith communities so many times. And, and, and the apostles say, listen, if you let this tip that direction, what's going to happen is the end, you're going to look around, there's going to be nobody left. You've eaten each other up. You've turned into cannibals. And then he goes on to say this in verse 16. I say then, now here's the alternative to that. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, the strong desire of the flesh. It can mean any strong desire. For the flesh lusts or struggles against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Rather than the express elevator to the stars, what he's describing here is life which is frequently involved in a series of ongoing struggles between flesh, which is simply our human nature apart from God's grace and love and transforming power, and spirit, God's spirit in us by his Holy Spirit meeting with us in that invisible place inside us, and those two things are wrestling back and forth, and that conflict can bring us to places where very small things can start to change everything. Going online when no one else is in the room. Lifting just one answer from someone else's exam. Allowing my coworkers to believe that I'm more important to that project at work than I really am. So this is what's being communicated to us sometimes by the world around. Like the antinomians who are being told, you just need to get rid of restraint, you'll be good. And like the syncretizers, if you just square with how the world is around you and just get in sync with everything that the culture is involved in, then you'll be good. Leave behind that ancient, dated, hopelessly irrelevant point of view that you were brought initially and take these steps and you'll be fine. So what Paul's really saying is those two things, you know, uh, getting freedom, and scoring up with culture, he's really saying those are really the same thing. They're making the world more about me. And what the good news told them is that Jesus is not about license or conflict or cultural cooperation. He's about two things only, love and serving. We have been set free not to eliminate any kind of boundary on our behavior, but we've been set free to love people because only free people really love. You can't do it because you're forced to. And we have been set free to serve people. And so rather than describing a whoosh to the penthouse, he's describing a series of struggles, challenges, tipping points between flesh and spirit, which if, 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 if we win, we can go one way. If we don't win, we can go the other way. You know, my uh, first computer had a, a disadvantage, too. Other than the fact that it wouldn't function above 80 degrees room temperature, and it weighed probably 50 pounds altogether, it was completely immobile, and required tractor feed paper, and to go from metallics to plain and back, you had to change a daisy wheel. Just despite all those things, those were, I thought of those as assets in those days. But it, it had this other feature, too, that I just, I, I, I found by accident. The first day I had it, I turned it on. <clears throat> I'm a writer by nature, and I just started typing. And watching the text appear, like, I, it was like the cavemen discovering fire. I, I watched the green text appear on the green screen scrolling downward, and before I knew it, I had written a 10-page essay. And I'm sitting back, I'm admiring my work, and I grab the attached keyboard like this, and I, I feel this slight protrusion under the front edge, and tap it the wrong way, and the essay <laughs> disappears. What was that that I touched? It was the reset button. Do you know what your phone and laptop do not have? 
One of those. <laughs> because when you touch it, everything you work on disappears. My whole that's, that could have been my first book. I could be famous by now. I have a Nobel Prize or something. I don't even remember what it was. It's all gone. I was just wiped out. But this is what a tipping point offers you. It's the reset button. Because a tipping point forces the choice of will I love? Will I serve? Or I'm going to be involved in conflict, cast off restraint, and just be another clone of whatever the world is around me. That button is intrinsic to every one of these moments. And God, by his grace, makes it available to us and says, here's this choice. You press it now. You press it now. friend is cruel to me, gotta love someone. My coworker says they don't understand me, who do I serve today? People are down on my case for things that I never did, which is the worst form. Who am I gonna love today? I'm getting pushed around on the street. Where can I serve someone? This opportunity gives me a chance to press that button and say, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be any of that. I'm not going to be a, a clone of anybody's culture, not anybody's. And I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to shut, shut down uh, uh, all of the things that I know keep me on, on the right path and just live like I'm the only person in the world or something. I've got a golden opportunity here. And in that opportunity, the two questions that get me through it is who should I love and where can I serve? And if I will answer those, I'm going to come out of that tipping point, headed in the right direction, not towards a burrito in the face, but towards a life that becomes increasingly more godly, more service, more love. It's about how we handle those moments. If we handle them rightly, the in-between stuff takes care of itself. Because these moments, they define all the other ones. Listen, I want to give you a chance to hit the reset button today. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, if you would, please. I'm just going to pray for you for a moment. Then John's going to lead us in a bit more worship. Uh, you know, it's not like we have to be on the verge of some collapse or some mortal sin or something like Sometimes these points are just things that seem small now. I never saw happening from that, that ancient computer what was going to happen to me. I, I never saw happening uh, when I joined a singing group way, 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 way back that I would end up with a wife on a day. I, I, I just, I never saw happening any of those things. But when we're led by the Spirit, we're going to press the right button. Lord Jesus, you're so good to us. You give us these chances over and over and over. Lord, I ask you to give that, that young man I saw this morning with his face and his food, that you would give him a reset button moment somehow. Somehow. You faced one yourself but chose to go to the cross for us. And now you've accomplished everything that we need to live in a completely different way. We ask you to pour your grace out on us now, Lord God. And whatever our tipping point might be, or whenever the next one comes up, that today we would, we would make that choice. We would press that button. And we would make our lives about who can I love? How can I serve? Thank you for that. We just love you, Lord. We're so grateful for you. We pray in Jesus' name. If you remain standing for just a minute, John's going to lead us into some worship. And uh, you know, as he does, just let the Lord speak to you. God might have something real specific to say to you today about direction or maybe a choice that you have coming up uh, in the future. And uh, it's a great time to just, to just receive that. If you'd like to have... Uh, prayer during this time uh, on a personal basis. Uh, Jan and I and Alan will be in the back and we'll be available.